Thank you. Warmest of welcomes to our time of worship this morning. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn, number 52. Number 52, the God of Abraham praise, who reigns enthroned above. Number 52, we'll stand to sing. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-blessed God in heaven, we bow before you, the living and the eternal God, the God who came to a man called Abram all those years ago, a man who came from an idol-worshipping family, a man who did not naturally seek after you, 
and we thank you, O oh Lord, that you called him not because of any good in him, and you gave him great promises, and you promised him a land, and you promised that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. We thank you, O oh Lord, that Abraham, as your son has said, rejoiced to see my day. We're told in your word that he had the gospel preached to him beforehand. We're told that he was right with you in the same way as we are. Through faith in the coming Messiah who we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looked forward to that great sacrifice that would be made on Calvary. And we look back, oh God, and we have the same Savior and the same faith. We thank you that Abraham believed in you and it was counted to him for righteousness. And we thank you that when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is accounted to us as righteousness. Not our own righteousness, a righteousness that is not within us, a righteousness that has not been earned by us, but a righteousness that has been given to us, that has been won for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for our blessed Saviour. We thank you that it is his righteousness alone that went backwards as well as forwards, that covered the Old Testament saints and covers us as New Testament believers. And Father, we thank you that there is only this one gospel, this one good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we hail Abraham's God and ours. We bless you for who you are. Be our portion. Be our high tower. Be the one that we continually resort to. We ask, O oh God, that you would be near us and that we would worship Abraham's God even this morning. That we would sing praises to you that you would be near us in our prayers. We thank you that the prayers of the saints are like sweet-smelling aroma to heaven. And, oh, Father, we pray that we, you would bless the reading of your word in a few moments. We thank you that you have said that the entrance of your words give light. And most of all, we pray for what we believe to be the highest point of our worship, the preaching of your word. Father, we pray for Dennis. We thank you for our brother and we pray for him that as he opens the scriptures that he would be consciously aware that you are leading him and guiding him. We pray that all that he has prepared and labored in over these last days would come to his memory and we ask that you would give him lucidity of thought and speech Lord, and we pray that we would not just, as it were, listen for his voice, but that we would be eager to listen to what you would have to say to us. Lord, we pray for receptivity. We ask, O oh Lord, for a responsive heart to not only hear your word, but to keep it, to put it into practice in our lives, to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, or maybe even to come to Jesus Christ for the very first time. We pray for any here this morning who've never called on your name, who have not been born again of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, we pray earnestly that today would be the day of salvation for even many, even here, oh Lord. Please be near us. We ask that we would depend upon you because we pray it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our precious Saviour. Amen. Dennis has asked me to read the opening ten verses of Ruth. The book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. After which Dennis will come and give a children's address. So Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1, page 240 in the Church Bible. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to to 10. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. 
he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Marlon and Chilion, Ephraimites of, ben- of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Marlon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Thank you, Ben. Good to be with you again. Greetings from the West. Not too far West, but uh, a little West of here. Now, I'm going to say something to the children. Where are we? Uh, You want to stay where you are? You don't want to come up forward. You don't want to get too close to the preacher, do you? I don't blame you. Uh, I'll just speak to you from there. You know about the book of Ruth. You you, you know about what happens with Ruth, uh, how she went and uh, had to leave her country because she wanted to be with God's people. Now, today, if we want to be Christians, do we have to go to another country? Sometimes Christians do that. They call them missionaries. You know, they go to some other country to bring the gospel. But but we don't have to go anywhere other than where we are right now in order to become a Christian. It was different in uh, in, uh, Ruth's day because God was dealing especially with one nation, Israel. But today, Jesus said to the disciples, go make disciples of all the nations. So whatever nation anyone is in, wherever we are, we can come to Christ from that point. We don't have to go to some special place. Like Ruth was from Moab, uh, and she went to Israel. Um, She wound up marrying uh, a relative of the husband who died, who she married in Moab. Um, The fact that we come to Christ from wherever we are is seen also in a very famous verse which you'll probably be familiar with, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, not just Israel, he loved the world, and so that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know what it means to believe in him? You know, we talk about that all the time, and I think sometimes people don't have quite a clear idea in their heads of what does it mean to believe in Christ, you know, I believe that uh, Queen Victoria existed. I believe that George Washington existed. Uh, But I don't believe in them the way we're supposed to believe in Christ. So there's something different about that believing in him. And we can tell from a couple of different people in the Bible. You know, there's, there's only two people that I'm aware of that Jesus said specifically, that person's going to be in heaven. The person by name. Now, one was a character in a parable. The other was a real person. The parable was uh, of the Pharisee and the uh, tax collector. They went into the temple to pray, and the the Pharisee, who was a religious leader, uh, he prayed to God and let God know how fortunate God was to have him, that he was such a good person, that he, he 
fasted twice a week and he gave money and he, he wasn't like those evil people like that tax collector. You know what a tax collector was in that day? Uh, tax collectors have never been very popular, but in that day they were really unpopular because they were collecting taxes for Rome, the, the, the occupying power. Uh, Israel had been occupied and taken over by Rome. And these men were, they were Jews, but they were working for the Roman government. So you can imagine how unpopular they would be. Uh, and they were. And so this man, these people were considered gross sinners. And so the Pharisee was so happy he wasn't like that. But the, the tax collector prayed also. And his prayer was a bit different from the other prayer. He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He recognized that he was a sinner. He recognized that he had done wrong and that he had no right to come to God, but he's asking for God's mercy. And you know what Jesus said? said, that man went down to his house justified, not the other one. And that's another way of saying he went down to his house forgiven and saved. Um, so that's one person. So there's one idea. The, believing means saying sorry to God, recognizing our sin, and asking for his mercy. The other person was a real person. We don't know what his name was. He's called the thief or the criminal. He was the one on the cross next to Jesus. And there was two criminals, one on either side. And they started, both started out uh, railing against Jesus like the others were, the, the religious leaders were there at the cross. And he started railing against Jesus. Why don't you save us if you're the king, you're the savior king that God has sent? But one of them changed while he was there on the cross. He recognized who Jesus was. And he recognized that he was there because he deserved to be there, because he had committed sins. But he knew that Jesus didn't. And so he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so he was recognizing who Jesus was recognizing that he had done wrong and was deserving of punishment. And then he asked for the Lord's mercy. That is what it means to believe. And that man heard the most wonderful words I think that anyone's ever heard from Jesus' lips in this room. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That meant that he, when he died, and he was going to die very soon because he was on the cross, you're going to be with me in paradise. That's what it means to believe, to recognize that we're sinners, and to ask for God's mercy and to make us a Christian, make us a believer in Christ. Uh, and so that's how you become a believer. If you haven't, boys and girls, uh, I pray that you will. Um, this is what the Lord wants. This is the most important thing in life. You know, there's a lot of things that are important in life. Uh, Money is not unimportant. Uh, health is very important. Friends are important. Uh, lots of things are important, but nothing, nothing is on the level of this, because this determines not only how you're going to live this life, but it determines how you're going to live forever, because we're all going to live forever. Did you know that? There isn't anybody who isn't going to live forever. Every single person who's ever been born is going to live forever in one place or the other, heaven or hell. Coming to Christ determines we're going to go to hell, uh, go, to, go to heaven, excuse me. If we don't, we go to hell. All right. Um, now, we're going to sing again. This is a song that man wrote about his wonderful experience of trusting Christ. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. It's 707 in your hymn books.
Well, we're going to continue reading in uh, Ruth, that first chapter, where we left off in verse 11. We're going to read down to verse 18. So it's Ruth, chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Let's listen to God's word. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from you, following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. All right, let's look to God in prayer again. Let's all pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we have this privilege to come and gather together in worship on your day. And we thank you, Father, that we also have the privilege of opening your word and and listening to you speak to us. And we we thank you for this lovely book of Ruth and what it tells us about you and about faith and about life in this world. And Father, we thank you for this marvelous confession of faith and commitment that Ruth gives here. Uh, Father, we thank you for the grace that came to Ruth's life, the same grace that is offered to all in the gospel, whatever nation, whatever age, whatever our condition is, that that gospel is offered to every human being in the face of the earth. Father, we thank you for such a, a huge, huge blessing and evidence of your grace and your mercy and your kindness. And Father, we uh, pray that you will help us to imitate the faith of this dear young Gentile woman uh, who came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we thank you for your mercy upon us today here in this place. Thank you for the mercies that we have already enjoyed from you today, the mercies of the week gone by. And Father, as we look ahead to the week ahead, we, we do not know what a day will bring forth. And we do not know what is going to happen, what will befall us. It may be joy, it may be sorrow, we do not know. But Father, we thank you that we can meet together in this place, call upon your name, and therefore go out from here confident that whatever happens, God will be with me. How we thank you for the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Lord, we know that you're here with us today, uh, especially. Uh, But Father, we pray that we might not only know that you are here present with us today, but we may experience it, uh, that your presence would be real, that you would speak to us, that you would open our ears and hear what you are saying to us through your word. Father, we know that we can read the words and it have very little effect upon us, but when you speak the words to us, there is effect, there is difference, there is change. We come into contact with the true and the living God uh, who changes us. Uh, Father, we thank you for these things. We Ask your blessing, Father, on the whole day. Uh, pray for your blessing later as the, everyone joins together for the Lord's table tonight as we worship. Father, we pray that we'll have a consciousness of really spending the Lord's day with the Lord, we pray. And Father, I pray for this fellowship here, for your blessing upon it, for Ben and all the leaders of the church, that you'll encourage them, give them wisdom. Uh, Father, we all know that these are not easy days to be a Christian. Uh, We pray, Father, for your guidance and direction for them. 
uh, as I pray for my church back in Milnrow, my former church in Hull and every place. Father, we can think of people that we know who are in different churches around the land, maybe other countries. Father, we pray for every place your word is being proclaimed today. Lord, come and draw near to your people. Help us, Father, in all of our many needs. Uh, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We ask that you would cleanse us afresh this morning from any sin, any thought, word, or deed which has not been pleasing in your sight. And Father, we are conscious of the, the truth of the, the hymn, prone to wander. We are prone, we have inclinations, Father, to fail to be what we ought to be as your children or to do those things which are not pleasing in your sight. And so, Father, we thank you that there is an atoning sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ, which continues to cleanse us from all sin. And Father, we pray that we may experience that afresh today. And Father, as well, we would pray for the government, for those in authority over us, not only in this land, but in other lands. We pray, Father, we, we are in a, a difficult time. We, uh, we see so much trouble around the world, and it seems to us that those in authority aren't quite sure what to do. Uh, and they're supposed to be sure what to do because they're, they're leading. We pray, Father, for your mercy upon them. We pray that you would uh, prevent those in authority from taking steps, passing laws which will be contrary to your word. We, we know that this has already happened. We pray, Father, that it won't happen further, uh, that you will enable us to continue worshiping you freely, proclaiming the gospel freely in this land, we pray. Uh, pray, Father, for your help also for any of us here today or any who are not here today, who are not well. Uh, Father, you know the, uh, the difficulties of living in this life and the body. We pray for your help and strength and healing and encouragement. Uh, Father, for those who are facing big decisions, we pray for wisdom. We thank you. You've told us to ask. Let ask for wisdom and it will be given. And Father, so we pray for wisdom for all who need it today. And Father, that we may have hearts that are open to your word, that we may have hearts that are uh, bowed before you, that are tender, that respond to your word and to your touch, we pray, that our meeting together here this morning would accomplish your good and gracious purposes, we pray. For our good and for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing one more time before we look at that passage in Ruth, and it's five, excuse me, seven, five, seven. O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou ever near me, my master and my friend.
of scripture we believe is <coughs> excuse me, equally true, but not all of scripture is equally relevant or helpful. This uh, lovely and encouraging little book of Ruth is both relevant and helpful. It tells of the experience of a family living in a dark time in Israel's history. And we're told that the things that took place were when the judges ruled. That was a time, as you know, when there was no king in Israel, and so we're told that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a, a phrase that wouldn't be too out of place in our day and generation as well. The people didn't follow the ways of God, at least not for very long, and not many of them. They only did when God raised up some judge to save them from their most recent oppressor. And there was a number of them, the Midianites, the Ammonites, the Philistines. If there were TV and internet back then, uh, most of the time people would have been hearing about how people were no longer following those old fashioned restrictions that people used to believe in. Sexual immorality would have been looked upon much differently, like today, it would have been considered sexual freedom, not immorality. People wouldn't have heard much about people like Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. Just like the media today doesn't tell us much about what godly Christians are doing. You'll look a long time before you find something like that. Uh, but they were there in those days, trusting in the God of the Bible, living lives of service to him, and having some influence on the people around them. It's helpful for us, I think, to be reminded that the same is true today. We hear little about godly people in the news today, except to ridicule them or to portray them as bigots. But they are there today, just as they were in the days when the judges ruled, sometimes more, sometimes less. There are Ruth's and Naomi's and men like Boaz out there today. Uh, they're there because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the same Savior God is seeking and saving the lost. So, I hope we'll be encouraged as we consider this passage, observe God's gracious dealings with his people, people who were once lost and then were found. The first thing we see here in this passage, it's a little bit in the background, but we know it's there, God gathering those who would be the ancestors of his son, according to his human nature. Uh, and that's, I'm sure, part of the purpose of this little book. You know, everything in the Bible, in some way or other, relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the center of the book. And uh, this tells the story of how a young Gentile girl came to have a place in the lineage of Israel's Messiah. And this really foreshadowed the fact that Israel's Messiah was also to be the savior of the world. Um, Ruth, of course, was not a Jew. It all started when this Israelite man, Elimelech, from Bethlehem, decided to take his family to live in Moab because there was a severe famine in Israel. Now, the move to Moab led to one of Elimelech's sons, Malon, marrying this Moabite woman, Ruth. All this was of the Lord. It was part of his plan for this young Moabite woman to be one of the human ancestors of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the story. I'm sure most of us do. After Malon's death, Ruth wound up in Israel, marrying a relative of his by the name of Boaz. And Boaz was the son of a Gentile woman, Rahab, who was, we're told, a harlot. Um, so Boaz was in the Messianic line. Boaz and Ruth's son, Obed, uh, their grandson, Jesse, and then their great-grandson, David. So there's the Messianic line, and there's Ruth with a place in it. Now, there are three Gentile women actually mentioned in the genealogy of the Lord in Matthew. Tamar was the other one. She's the woman that Judah slept with, was actually his daughter-in-law, unbeknownst to him. So that's, along, that's the third one, along with Ruth and Rahab. These are fascinating little facts hidden away in the Old Testament, which point us to a couple of important gospel truths. First, it was always God's plan to save Gentiles as well as Jews. Uh, the Jews were never to be intended to be God's chosen people to the exclusion uh, of all the rest. Saving Gentiles was not an afterthought. Uh, somehow this fact seemed to have escaped some of the more zealous uh, Israelites. But um, we can see this very clearly from a prayer of... Um, 
of Solomon when he was dedicating the temple. <clears throat> now it's in 1 Kings chapter 8. There we go. This is part of what Solomon prayed when he was dedicating the temple. Um, now I think it's here somewhere. Ah, oh, yes, here it is. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this temple, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. So it was always God's plan. Solomon recognized that, and we find other instances of that in the Bible. So that's, that's here. But also, God's plan was always to save sinners, the ungodly, the unrighteous. Uh, it had to be, of course, because there is nobody else. <laughs> There's nobody naturally righteous in this world. All have sinned. So including people like Rahab and Tamar would make that unmistakably clear. Um, but still... Uh, sometimes the self-righteous tend to overlook that fact and tend to look down on the bad sinners like the Pharisee in the temple there. The, the truth is that there's, there's enough sin in each one of us to send us to hell forever. Um, so this book of Ruth is so important because it gives us a little inside information as to how that process of gathering together those who would be in the Messianic line and therefore help to bring about the coming into the world of the Savior, both Jew and Gentile. And that's good for us. I assume that most of us here are Gentiles, and so that should be good news for us. So that's the first thing we notice here, as I say, almost kind of in the background. Uh, but then we also see the fact that God leads his people through many troubles. I think Paul said this in the book of Acts, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Uh, and why must it be this way? Well, we don't really know for sure. Uh, Robert Murray McShane said, affliction will certainly purify a believer, and I think that's true. Uh, he also said, interestingly enough, and I think this is true too, there's a great lack about all Christians who have not suffered. Uh, some flowers must be broken or bruised before they emit any fragrance. All the wounds of Christ send out sweetness. All the sorrows of Christians do the same. Might be helpful to remember that when we're going through difficulties and trials. Uh, I think most of us have seen this in the lives of Christians that we've known through the years. Suffering tends to produce a sweetness and a spirit of meekness uh, that nothing else will. Uh, if we submit to the Lord in the trials, <laughs> if we fight against them, then it may not do us the good that God intends. So the people of Israel were suffering through a famine. We know that there was a time like that during Gideon's time. Uh, whether the book of Ruth was around then or not, we don't know, but it had to be in the earlier years uh, because remember Boaz was Rahab's son and Rahab was in the early part of the conquest. Jericho was the first place they went to. So it had to be early in, maybe 50 years or so afterwards, we don't know. Um, so because of this famine, Elimelech left Bethlehem. Uh, it's ironic because Bethlehem, of course, the, means, the name means house of bread. Well, there was no bread there at that time. So he and his wife Naomi and the two sons, Melon and Chilion, left to go to live in Moab. Now I know that some commentators blame Elimelech for doing this. Uh, they say it was wrong to leave Israel. It was a lack of faith, a lack of loyalty. Well, I don't know what you think about that. It's possible. It's possible. We can't say for sure because the Bible isn't specific. But I'm not so sure about it because there are examples of other people who left Israel during times of famine. I can think of people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and his sons. God sent Elijah to Sidon during the famine. There was the widow that Elisha advised to leave during the famine. Uh, and of course, Joseph was told to take Mary and the baby Jesus to Egypt. So I'm not persuaded that Imelech and the family were necessarily wrong in leaving. Um, because of that, I'm not persuaded that Elimelech died because he left Israel. Uh, but that thought might have been in Naomi's mind. 
as it is often in the minds of believers when some hard thing happens. Is God displeased with me for something? Am I being chastised for something I did wrong? Well, sometimes that is true, but not always. Uh, but that thought must have been there for Naomi. Uh, and she wouldn't have known for sure, but it would have made a very sad time harder for her to bear. So at some point, her two sons married two Moabite women, as you would imagine, living in Moab, Moab now, and they'd been there for about 10 years. Here again, some commentators say they sinned by doing so. They shouldn't have married. Well, it may be so, but it's by no means completely clear. The Israelites were commanded not to marry the people of Canaan. It's true. Um, Moab, strictly speaking, wasn't Canaan. Uh, but also think about things like Joseph marrying the daughter of an Egyptian priest and Moses marrying the daughter of a priest of Midian when he fled from Pharaoh. So uh, we don't know. Those who think they sinned by marrying Moabite women tend to believe that that's why they died, that God punished them for that. Well, whatever the truth is, it was all terrible and distressing for Naomi. To lose her husband and then her only two sons would have been awful. So there is the grief, uh, which would have been devastating, but also this put Naomi in a difficult spot. Uh, how would she provide for herself? Uh, women alone in that day and culture had very few options. Uh, it's unlikely that her husband left much, if anything, besides a piece of land in Bethlehem. And jobs for women back then were very, very scarce. So what would she do? Well, as we see that God is fulfilling his plan of redemption in all these circumstances, we see God leading his people through deep sorrows, uh, and nobody had deeper sorrows in all of this than Naomi. Uh, but she has one bright spot here, these two daughters-in-law. They seem genuinely affectionate and concerned for Naomi. Uh, so then there was a glimmer of hope also when she heard about food back in Israel. And that brings us to what I want to focus on for the rest of the time here is uh, we see how God's drawing people to himself and how they fully embrace the Savior. Um, Naomi's two daughters-in-law decide to go with Naomi. And so they all start back on the way to Bethlehem. But they don't get very far before Naomi realizes that this is really too much to ask of these two young women to accompany her to a strange land they know nothing about, leaving their families, their home, everything they've ever known and loved. Um, but also, mo most importantly, they would probably have less prospect of ever finding a husband in Judah. Um, Naomi will have no more children, as she says, and uh, presents the ridiculous idea of waiting until they grow up, even if she had children, which of course they wouldn't do. All this is true, but it's interesting here. It seems that Naomi has a bit of a blind spot, as far as we know. She, she's not thinking about their spiritual welfare at this point, is she? She's thinking about their temporal welfare. Uh, she doesn't seem to be thinking about spiritual things. Maybe she's making them count the cost, but she's grieved for these two young women, and she believes that it's all her fault, as she says here in verse 13. No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And you can understand that. She feels that she has now dragged these two women into a situation where they're really in trouble, and she doesn't want to make it any worse for them by going to a strange country. She seems to believe those who see these things as somehow punishment. The Lord's hand has gone out against me. Uh, that's her view of it. That doesn't mean that the Lord was against her in any of this. We don't believe that he was. Um, and those are the same things that the, the same kind of things that Job's comforters were saying. So it was part of God's plan to bless and honor Job. And it seems to me it was also part of God's plan to bless and honor Naomi. We don't know. That isn't spelled out. But surely we can see the hand of God in all of this. We see his plan to draw Ruth to himself. Orpah listens to her mother-in-law, returns to her family. No one can blame her for that. So Naomi urges Ruth to do the same thing, but Ruth refuses. And then we have this tremendous statement of faith and commitment and devotion. One of the most beautiful statements found in the Bible. Interestingly enough, uh, it's a statement that uh, 
was quoted to, uh, to Mr. Churchill during the war. He was trying to get America to help out more and more, and Roosevelt sent a, uh, an advisor over to just find out what Churchill was all about and what was going on. And he was very impressed by everything he saw. And he quoted this verse to Churchill, uh, that we will be with you, uh, you our God will be our God, even to the end, he said. And Churchill, as he often did in his life, was streaming with tears at the realization of this. Well, it's a, it's a lovely verse. Uh, Naomi may not have talked about spiritual things, but there was certainly spiritual fruit from her life. Uh, Naomi had made both of them count the cost, and Ruth has counted it, but she feels she must pay the price, whatever it is. Uh, and so what we hear in these five things that she says here that I want to mention now, we hear the voice of someone who has been found by the Lord, as someone who has been given new life and faith. And this is her confession of faith, really. I'll just read it again, verses 16 and 17. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Well, there's five interesting things here that tell us about Ruth's faith. First, there's a commitment to go anywhere. These are Ruth's words to Naomi. Uh, through whom she has learned of the God of the Bible. Uh, but this is also the response of faith that we would hear from a New Testament believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He decides where I am to go and where I will go because I want to be with him and follow him. Uh, some have uh, told the Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. That's a very bold promise to make to the Lord. Uh, but that's kind of what Ruth is saying here. These are the words of surrender to the Lordship of Christ. And if we have something of this in our hearts, then we have been called by that same Savior. If we don't, then we need to ask why and to seek him that we may. Because these are the sentiments of somebody who wants to follow the Lord. It's a commitment also to live anywhere. Going anywhere uh, is one thing. We can stand pretty much anything or any place for a brief time, but to live anywhere is entirely different. You know, sometimes people go someplace on holiday and they say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to live there? But if they move there, they might find out it was different living there than just having a holiday there. Uh, now, God is not going to lead us somewhere where we will be miserable for the rest of our lives. He gives us grace to live where he calls us to live. But the thing is that we don't know where God will lead us when we start. Now, as I look around, some of us have been on the road for quite a while, some of us have not been, and uh, we don't know how it's going to end up. Uh, when we first put our faith in Christ, uh, we don't know where he's going to send us. We don't know what it's going to be. Abraham, you know, went out not knowing where he was going, and that's very much a, a, an apt description of the Christian life, of beginning the Christian life. We don't know where it's going to be. If you think you do, you're probably mistaken. Um, we have to trust God with our future. I was uh, a missionary candidate years ago in the States in a particular denomination, and uh, I wasn't sure where the Lord wanted me to go, but one thing I was sure, I knew I didn't want to go, and that was where I wound up. <laughs> because Western Europe is not exactly, as we all know, not exactly a, a hot spot for spiritual activity. Uh, we don't see droves of people coming in to hear the gospel. We don't see the church growing the way we would like to. And so that wasn't where I wanted to go. But the Lord had a, he, um, he sent a young lass from Yorkshire over to America, where I was living at the time, and so here I am. Um, but there's another dimension to this as we get older. We don't know where we're going to spend our last days. Uh, Ruth says, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Wherever God leads her, she's willing to go. There's also a commitment here to accept God's people. Your people shall be my people. Uh, by this we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. This is basic and fundamental. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Uh, the fact is that if you don't love the sheep, you're probably not part of the flock. 
you're probably not a sheep after all if you don't love the sheep. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that you'll never disagree with another believer. You may do or say things that you'll be sorry for. Um, one thing is to be expected. God will not always put us with other believers that we find it easy to love. But he will always give us the grace to love them. A believer is someone that Jesus loves so much that he came from heaven's glory to suffer and die for him, to hang on that cross in agony for him. So no genuine Christian wants to fail to love any one of those sheep for whom the Savior bled and died. And we see that love certainly in Ruth for Naomi. There's also a commitment to accept Christ, to accept God in Christ. This is not just my Savior, not just my Lord, not just Head of the Truth. This is God of very God, the image of the invisible God, we're told. The Word become flesh. He is God, and He's my God, and I want Him as God, as Ruth wants the God of Naomi. He's the God, the very creator of the universe, the source of all life, the source of my life, and the one who holds me and the entire universe in his hands. And so Ruth accepts this God and wants no other. It's also a commitment for all until life is finished. In verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. Till death us do part, are words of the old marriage covenant. Uh, they're applicable here too. Of course, we know that in one sense, for the Christian, death, of course, is not the end. Death is really the beginning. It's the beginning. But the meaning here is clear. No turning back for Ruth. Uh, like, again, that little chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And that's what Ruth is saying here. I'm going. I'm going for the, for the whole time. Uh, that should be the confession of faith of every believer. Uh, at least uh, some sense of that. Uh, we notice a few things about this great confession of faith by Ruth. First, it came after Naomi tried to dissuade her. Uh, people should know something of the cost, and the cost for Ruth was considerable. She was leaving her father, mother, any other family, the land of her birth, everything she'd come to know. The testimony of the grace of God in Naomi's life must have been powerful for Ruth to leave all to go with her. She must have seen something of that gracious God in Naomi's life. Also, it was only after Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem that Ruth made this confession of faith. And that's interesting. You know, sometimes people only come to a point of decision and trust when they feel that they're in danger of losing it. <laughs> they're in danger of the possibility not being there for them. Um, finally, nothing could dissuade Ruth from her confession of faith and following Naomi. And nothing, I don't believe, can stop a person when God truly calls, when they truly hear God speaking to them through his word. So we see God here fulfilling his great redemptive plan, gathering those who will be in the messianic line, both Jew and Gentile. We see him leading his people through troubles. We see him leading, drawing sinners to himself, Sinners who respond and embrace the Savior. It's the same work that he's still doing today. Uh, we see it here in the Old Testament. So is that where you would see yourself today? Do you identify with Ruth or do you identify with Orpah? Uh, we all identify with one or the other. Uh, we saw the challenge in front of us and we turned away. Or we saw that challenge in front of us and we went and accepted. Um, so, have you counted the cost? Have you realized that you must decide or lose Christ? Can anything stop you from following Christ? That's a good test for all of us. What does it take to keep you from doing what God wants you to do? Um, well, if he's really called you, if you've heard the shepherd's voice, you won't. You'll respond to that love that will not let you go. And therefore, in return, you won't let him go. I pray that's true for each of us here this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this book of Ruth that you've given to us to show us a bit of what's happened there in the Old Testament and see the, the faith of an Old Testament believer. It's 
not different from the faith of a New Testament believer. Some things are different, true, uh, but that faith is the same. The God is the same. The Savior God is the same. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the offer of the gospel that goes out to each one of us. Uh, We pray, Father, I pray for each one here today. Any who may not have responded to that offer yet, they may recognize in what Ruth has done what they should do as well in responding to this offer of eternal life. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. I'm going to sing in closing number 579. Somebody who heard the voice. Not an audible voice, of course. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.